Hello, and welcome to the Video Essay Podcast. I'm your host, Will DeGravio. Today's episode features reflections from individuals who attended a recent symposium in Hanover, Germany, titled Videography, Art and Academia, Epistemological, Political, and Pedagogical Potentials of Audiovisual Practices. The symposium was funded from a grant provided by the Volkswagen Foundation, thus allowing for individuals to travel and attend without paying out of pocket. Of course, not everyone in our community of practice could attend such an event. However, many conversations took place during the symposium with regard to the need for more events going forward, the need to obtain funding to, again, provide for travel and other associated costs with such events, and the need to ensure that a range of new and diverse voices are participating in conversations about our field. In that spirit, and in an attempt to open up some of the conversations had during the event to those not in attendance, the podcast, in collaboration with the symposium organizers, invited participants to reflect on the theme of openness. Specifically, participants were asked to reflect on the term openness as it emerged prominently in Hanover, such as in its relation to the local and the global, our sense of community and network, and the challenges and potentials that are associated with it. On this episode, you will first hear from the symposium organizers, Anna-Sophie Filippi, Mikey Reinerth, Kathleen Locke, and Evelyn Kreutzer, who offer some reflections on the symposium as a whole. And let me, on behalf of all the participants, thank the organizers for all of their incredible work and, and generosity in, in putting this event together, and for making us feel so at home in Hanover, and for all that will be generated from this symposium in the months and years ahead. Following the conversation between the organizers, you will hear from participants reflecting on the theme of openness. I was going to offer my own reflection, but unlike the other participants, I had the privilege of listening to what everyone else had to say as I edited this episode. So I will simply leave you with this reflection, what they said. Das kann sich jeder vorstellen und ich glaube, es wäre cool, wenn wir alle sagen würde, in, in einem Co-Organizer of the Videography Symposium in Hanover oder irgendwie sowas. Oder am Ende, we are the... the alle zusammen! Ja. <lacht> nee, nee. Jeder ein Wort. Nee, in vier verschiedenen Sprachen gleichzeitig. <lacht> ja, genau. <lacht> Uh, I'm Evelyn Kreutzer. I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher at the Film University Babelsberg, and I'm one of the organizers of the Hannover Symposium on Videography. And I was just curious to ask my fellow organizers to introduce themselves and then to tell me one specific object or image that stuck with them from the symposium. And then I would hand it over to Anna. Okay, so um, I'm Anna Sophie Philippi, and I'm a PhD candidate from Film University as well. And the object um, I'm thinking of is a cup of coffee. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now I have to hand over to Kathleen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Kathleen Log. Uh, I'm a professor of American Studies and Media Studies at Leibniz University Hanover. And uh, I'm also co-organizer of the um, videography symposium um, that was held here in Hanover. And uh, one of the objects that I can think of is um, the mask. <laughs> because uh, we uh, were all wearing masks and that's it. And uh, I give over to Maike. Yeah, hi, my name is Maike Reinert. I'm also from Film University where I'm uh, also a postdoctoral researcher and I'm the fourth uh, co-organizer of the symposium. And when I think of the symposium, I think of the broken headphones that we handed out with the masks. And I realized I didn't actually mention an object myself. So my object, of course, is the framed uh, Tom Jones sex bomb uh, um, CD cover or record cover that was plastered all over the hotel and was hanging on top of a lot of hotel beds for some reason. 
Well, so we got together again to talk a little bit about uh, the symposium and give our own feedback. <laughs> and uh, we wanted to talk about the topic of openness and um, maybe uh, Anna and Maike, you can say a little bit about whether you think the organization um, of the symposium actually met the goals that uh, we had um, when we started out. Maybe we first can like just remember what we intended to do. And I think one of the most important like aims for a symposium were to connect German, European and like international communities um, on videography. And I think we generally succeed, uh, succeeded. Yeah, I think one of the like really great things is that um, we invited a couple of uh, colleagues from Film University who did not in the like narrow sense work with um, videographic criticism before, but who we thought would fit well. And they came to the symposium and kind of became really invested. So now when I walk around Film University, I can speak to people who are also interested in videography and there are already plans to do uh, another workshop and to do more to connect specifically what here at Film University is being done under the, uh, the umbrella term of artistic research. And maybe just like to add on, um, I just remembering right now that on our last day um, at the symposium, we had like a round table. And I remember that during this round table or before we decided as a group to, to, to change, like to rearrange the seats in the room to really mm -hmm. like build some kind of like a circle with the seats. And um, for me, this was some kind of like an expression of how we would like to invest in openness and how we would like to, to rearrange and how we would like to talk to each other. And yeah, this was some kind of like an important memory for me. Yeah, it was a, a very welcoming gesture, I think. So, um, I mean, one thing we did was the round tables, but there was also um, a mentoring program involved in uh, the symposium. And maybe Kathleen and Evelyn, you could tell us a little bit more about the the mentoring program, how we and specifically the two of you set out to um, yeah to structure it and how did you succeed with uh, having it open and welcoming as well? Yeah, so um, Evelyn and uh, I were working on the mentorship program and uh, we kind of tried to make it um, as open as possible. Um, and the idea was to match people um, who have not done um, videographic work yet or were just starting out with really established uh, mentors and uh, really yeah important big people big big names in the field um, so um, we had a call for papers and we were very curious like how many people would actually apply um, for this mentorship program uh, that started already ahead um, of the conference uh, of the symposium and so the idea was that mentor and mentee could actually meet in person at the symposium and uh, yeah we were kind of overwhelmed by um, how many um, people actually applied. And uh, then we had to make the difficult decision of actually selecting, I think we had um, 11 uh, mentees. And in the selection, we tried to also broaden the scope of the videographic network that we have right now that exists at the moment to kind of include people from different places, from different stages uh, in their careers. Uh, so we had uh, PhD students, uh, postdocs, and also professors and MA students uh, in our mentorship program. And uh, for our selection, of course, we had a look at the quality of the projects that were being pitched to us, but also like where people came from. And uh, in order to have like a more diverse uh, group, uh, also diverse uh, in a geographical sense, and to kind of broaden the network that uh, right now uh, is very Europe and uh, yeah US centric. Um, so um, that that was the main goal in terms of openness there. And uh, maybe Evelyn, you can say a little bit more uh, about how that turned out at the conference. We did receive the largest amount of applications from the UK and the US overall, I would say. Not that many from Germany, actually, and uh, not that many from outside of Europe and the US. Uh, and I mean, so that, that speaks to maybe the way that that the, the call also traveled or the limitations of our circles and when where we can circulate them. And I think that's one of the things we might want to think about going forward is how we can 
um, reach academic and, and artistic and uh, educational circles um, in all parts of, of the globe. But still just um, thinking about who came and, and how it all went, I think we ended up with a really, really interesting, diverse group of people with different projects uh, from different stages, from working in different languages too, and on films or <clears throat> media from different national contexts. I think most of them have, have really had never touched any videographic projects before. Several of them I remember didn't really know or said they didn't really know what video essays actually were um, before they, they started working on it and having their first conversations, which is always really exciting to just be, to be able to observe people getting introduced to, to the format. And the first thing that surprised me in the best way when we came to the symposium was to see how much the mentor and mentee teams had been in touch uh, leading up to the symposium. Since we invited very busy, very uh, uh, important scholars to serve as mentors, uh, we were trying to be very careful in terms of how much time we could ask them to, to dedicate to, to this program in advance of the symposium. So I think we only asked them to meet on Zoom once or at least once uh, before the symposium. And then we found out that several of them had met numerous times, had had many one-on-one -on -one conversations, but also group uh, conversations, which was uh, really miraculous. So it, it, when, when we all came to the symposium, it felt to me that some of these mentors and mentees were meeting each other as close friends and collaborators already. Uh, uh, it, was, it was really quite sweet to see um, how supportive and nice uh, that atmosphere already was established even before the in-person meeting could happen in, in Hannover. I think one of the most interesting and nicest things for me to see was how these big name scholars who are really established in the field of videographic scholarship would come to a symposium, not to give a talk or, or a keynote lecture, but be there as these mentoring presences and voices in the room and not just in, in their collaborations with their specific mentees, but even beyond that, uh, really serving as mentors in all the Q&A sessions uh, for everyone else in, in one way or another as well. Uh, and I don't take that for granted to, to know that these people would fly in not to present their own work, but to um, really support everyone else. Yeah, and I also think that um, uh, watching the mentees at the conference, that uh, they too um, kind of felt that they belonged. So I think in that sense, um, they participated, they asked questions, um, they talked to other people. So I think uh, that was also um, a quite um, yeah successful. But uh, as Evelyn said, um, we tried to see like where the applications would come from. Um, but I think um, there's still room for improvement uh, in terms of um, diversity and uh, a reach uh, that that's that goes beyond Europe, uh, the UK, uh, and and the US. So that's something to keep working on. Yeah, I I, I recall that uh, in the final discussion, some I think someone uh, brought up um, this idea that. Uh, if you pay people to come, then they, they're going to take it uh, seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, of course, we couldn't pay any uh, any fees, but um, we could arrange for like funding for, for travels. And it was actually also kind of a um, yeah, it was it was good funding. So so we could bring people in and have them have them stay at a nice hotel and get food, etc. I think that that was a very good starting point to do such a thing as a mentoring program but yes i i also see what you said evelyn and kathleen there could have been different mentees or people or mentees from different uh, regions of the world yeah might have benefited from that as well but we didn't reach them for whatever reasons so yeah and not just talking about the mentorship um it actually it, it applies to the whole conference to all participants I remember that in the beginning, like when we wrote the application to um, to receive the funding, we wanted to reach researchers, um, videographic researchers around the globe. <laughs> but uh, actually, we like mainly got people from Europe and from the US. I think all the 
um, like transatlantic or long distance flights came from the US. I'm not sure if I'm right, but I think so. Um, so I sure we definitely could could improve uh, in terms of geographic or cultural diversity. I think, I mean, one thing that plays into this, of course, is that the idea was to um, connect an already kind of established community with other people. So uh, I, I was not surprised when uh, most people we invited uh, came from this more or less established community. And as we've established by now, that's uh, mainly uh, yeah American and European community. So um, I don't know what, what, what would have made it um, more attractive or uh, what would have made us also think of other people to invite in the first place and not um, make them find the mentor mentorship program which would have been possible, of course, but um, it we didn't invite the, the mentees. Um, so we just put the call out there and it circulated in, in, in certain ways. So it could be found or it wasn't found. Um, but yeah, so I think that's kind of what, maybe it's maybe what we aimed for was uh, a little too high for su such a thing or the event uh, would have, yeah, I don't know. Would have had to be um, even even bigger, longer, more people. But I think, on the other hand, we would have lost something as well. We would have lost um, a familiar sense and the the kind of quite welcoming um, atmosphere, the room that was packed. Um, I mean, we could have used a couple of more seats. Um, talking to you, Volkswagen Stiftung, um, but. <laughs> But um, that was also, I think, the main reason for all the, the good aspects that, that you touched upon. That it was um, a setup that was friendly um, for everyone involved and everyone yeah, felt welcome, I hope. Yeah, I, th I think we're the, these are two sides of the same coin in a way. We, we can't, I think we're, we're observing a, possibly a lot of typical advantages and shortcomings that happen when a new field is still in the early stages of, of developing itself and defining itself. Uh, the good thing is that it's still, it really seems very much based on relationships. And I think that's one of the, like the sense of community that we've all experienced um, and many people have emphasized was so strong. I think that that's really special to the videographic community, but it also means that things like the call for applications for the mentorship program might circulate through these relationships, which are might be diverse in terms of uh, nationalities, but are still mostly tied to educational structures and um, institutions um, in Europe and the US. So in a way, like the, the, the strength of relationships, I think, is the strength of this discipline and this field, but it also poses challenges to the yeah the reach that that we're talking about and the global yeah i think i want to stress again that of course it was really nice to see everyone again in person after such a long time that uh we haven't really seen each other um so it was nice to have familiar faces there and i think in terms of different career stages and so on and um also like a kind of geographical distribution we have maybe not met our own goals, but I think we didn't do very badly either. So I think it was, uh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, we, it, it's okay, but it's also something that we can pass on to the next uh, organizers. And uh, of course, uh, we all hope that there will be more conferences like this. And uh, of course, there's a difference whether it's on Zoom or in person, whether you have the funding to bring people over or not. And so, um, yeah, I think uh, that's something to also keep in mind. And uh, talking about openness also uh, at the Volkswagen Stiftung, of course, uh, this was not a public event, but a few students uh, actually uh, were allowed to come. And uh, of course, we had the public screening in the evening. Uh, so a few of my uh, students who are currently taking um, the videographic criticism class with me uh, were actually um, uh, able to come. And I think it was also a really great experience and tells us, OK, that these kinds of events, yeah, maybe um, should be available for people 
uh, on the local level as well or made made uh, possible which should be made possible for them to uh, attend these events and also for students so that we can uh, actually talk about them in class afterwards which we did and uh, the students were really uh, very much impressed by uh, certain uh, uh, presentations, by discussions uh, and debates that were going on. And uh, uh, so I think that was also in terms of openness, um, that was quite productive uh, in that sense. Uh, and there could have been more of that. I was just thinking <laughs> that it's, it's, it was like some kind of like a nice uh, last statement. Of yeah, words. was that a nice last statement? I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Yeah, there, there should be more of this. So it's, yeah, uh, that's it's I mean. a yeah. legacy, and <laughs> let's yeah. hope for let's hope for more more of this. I hope there are some uh, some more workshops and symposiums uh, in the works right now. I hope I'm so. sure there are. I mean, it's really exploded last year year or two. And uh, I mean, the the great tragedy of this event, of course, was um, our failed karaoke plan. Karaoke, yeah. So, um... I thought the tragedy was that I couldn't be there. For you. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, you could be there for part of it. The real yes. tragedy was failed karaoke night. So um, this is uh, perhaps the, the most important takeaway or agenda for the next group of organizers. Hi everyone, my name is Annalisa Pellino and this year I got a PhD in Visual and Media Studies at Hulme University in Milan, Italy. And I took part at the Nove Symposium within the Videographic Mentorship Program with a video essay um, that is part of my PhD research focused on the cinematic voice. And that's the reason why, uh, among the different connotations of openness discussed in ANOVA, uh, the one that moved my interest the most uh, is the idea of epistemic openness, or uh, what Alan O'Leary called as a, an, a, an ebular epistemic, uh, using a very poetic and effective expression. Indeed, uh, if the VDSA can actually be considered as an open form that lends itself to a wide range of uses uh, between criticism and everyday audiovisual practices and culture. So it is the voice because it has a paradoxical status that, uh, that lies always in between, for example, uh, between embodiment and disembodiment, body and language, and between identity and positionality, and so on. So, it seems to me that videographic criticism and cinematic voice shared this call for a methodological openness that refused to ground a stable ontology or epistemology. And therefore, what I'm interested in is exactly this uh, discursivity and this anti-essentialist approach uh, that can be helpful, in my opinion, to focus more on the heuristic value of these moving and fleeting objects that are always in transition. Yeah, that's my idea about openness in videographic criticism. My name is Alan O'Leary. I'm Associate Professor of Film and Media at Aarhus University, Denmark. In reflecting on the theme of openness, I want to talk about the character of constraint-based approaches to videographic criticism. A key model for the work I do as a videographic scholar is the 2003 film, The Five Obstructions, in which Lars von Trier sets his fellow Danish filmmaker Jörn Lett the task of remaking parts of the latter's classic short film, The Perfect Human, 
according to five sets of perverse constraints. These sets of constraints are the five obstructions of the title. Constraints are very important to us in videographic criticism. Referred to as parameters, they are used to teach the practice at the annual Middlebury workshops. And in order to aid and generate analysis of media objects, many have found it useful to adopt or adapt the Middlebury exercises or to develop their own sets of parameters or algorithmic procedures. As Chris Keithley and Jason Mattel have famously put it, formal parameters lead to content discoveries. The constraints set in the five obstructions operate in a different way from how we understand parametric work in the videographic context, however. The purpose of von Trier's obstructions in Danish Bainspain, which means something like a deliberate tripping up, is not so much to reveal something about the original film, The Perfect Human, but is instead to push your Let von Trier's friend and mentor beyond Let's habitual stylistic and even ethical procedures. At one point, von Trier jokes about his capricious, even sadistic obstructions saying that they are part of a Help Your Let project. In a 2008 essay on the five obstructions, Hector Rodriguez asks an interesting question. He asks whether generative or constraint-based artworks must always comprise tightly closed formal systems, or whether and how formal constraints can also open up the work to the life that is lived while making it. Whether and how constraints can open up the work to the life lived while making it. It's this porous character of formal constraints that interests me. The way in which an act of analytical distillation is also and paradoxically an invitation, an opening to the messy world beyond the analysis. The very rigor of the parametric procedure leads to a suggestive impurity of results. To adapt Keithley and Mattel, formal parameters lead to content contamination. Hello, Will, and hello, everybody. This is Barbara Zecchi. I'll be obedient and I'll follow instructions. So one, I will not thank the organizer for such a generous and extraordinary symposium. And two, the instructions say that we have to be in a quiet place unless an artistic impulse directs us elsewhere. I'm in a quiet place more or less, but I feel the urge to do something artistic in line with my presentation in Hanover. So I will speak in Italian accented English. So my uh, reflection about openness, um, for my reflection about openness, I will uh, address four points. So number one, uh, our wonderful community. This gathering proved once more that we are quite an uncommon group. We are not competing against each other, but we are collaborating and helping each other. Therefore, people feel comfortable about being very open and showing their vulnerabilities and talking about uh, their own insecurities and weaknesses rather than hiding them. And I believe that we really need to maintain this spirit and treasure it. And uh, second, related to the first point, uh, it would be great to continue our conversations and collaborations in person with an annual appointment of this sort of course, fundraising is a major endeavor. So I think that launching our own international association would give more institutional visibility to our discipline. This would be great for our junior colleagues and our graduate students. It would also reinforce globally our network. And uh, if we pay association fees proportional to our ranking based on annual income, and the country where we work, um, it would be a, a way to get fund for 
having an annual conference. Uh, a great model for this is LASA, the Latin American Studies Association, that has different uh, fees according to different countries. If someone wants uh, to help me figuring this out, uh, please let me know. Uh, my email address is bzecchi at umass.edu. And uh, uh, number three, this, uh, um, we are a very open and welcoming group, as I said, but uh, as it was discussed at the symposium, we could do better. Uh, we are quite diverse in terms of gender, sexual orientation, even age, which is one of the most invisible categories of uh, discrimination. Uh, we have different scholarly interests, but we could certainly improve, uh, in, improve in including more racial and ethnic minorities. So uh, this leads me to number four, my fourth point, uh, that maybe the mentorship program, uh, the mentorship could be an idea. The mentorship program was an outstanding and very rewarded, rewarding initiative um, uh, in an whole and ho an over and I hope we will continue again it could be a way to foster diversity by choosing students uh, that come from a diverse background uh, and time is running out almost four minutes so I should stop here uh, thank you uh, for listening and goodbye everybody hope to see you very very soon bye bye I am Johannes Pinotto, I'm a film and media scholar and video essayist. And when asked to reflect upon the concept of openness, um, I had to think about the very technical procedure that video essayists are all so familiar with. When extracting film clips from a DVD or from a Blu-ray, we used to call that ripping, and I really like this word because it resonates with the idea that in videographic research we try to open up the body of film, literally. We try to access it in a new way, but we also want to turn it open for others and for their investigation. But um, since quite some time, I also keep thinking about how that practice of opening up the film body might have to do with our own body and our understanding of it. We tend to think of our bodies as being separated from our surroundings. I mean, we commonly speak of an inside of our body and an outside, and we behave as if our skin were some clear border. But in fact, and if we look more closely, our body is of course not closed, but open radically open, be it mouth, nose, eyes, ears or anus, even down to the pores of our skin, we need to be open in order to survive, to eat and to digest, to sweat, to cry, to speak, to hear, to see, all this necessarily happens at and across all these openings. And these openings are highly delicate, they're very easily infected, but without them we would suffocate. So... We could realize that our body is porous. It's not some vault, but it's more like a sponge or a cloud or a loaf of bread. And I have the feeling that making video essays made me more aware of that. It definitely made my practice as a scholar, but also me as a person, more porous and more vulnerable. And I would also like to give others the sense of safety that they feel that they can afford to be that. So for me, a crucial question really is, is kind of like how to, um, yeah, how to build a space in, in which we feel that we as researchers, but also our practice, um, can be more porous. Hello, my name is Cormac Donnelly. I'm a senior lecturer in film at Liverpool John Muir's University and I was uh, a speaker, an attendee at the symposium in Hanover. Um, actually, as I look back through my notes, it's interesting to see the words that sort of stick out to me, the words that obviously meant something to me in the room and the ones that I wanted to kick, take down and reflect on. So things like intuition and feeling and vulnerability and doubt, um, contribution, um, 
I've taken a lot of notes about the, the mentor workshop. And I think in terms of openness, um, the mentor program was kind of this fascinating exploration of how, um, how the community reacts to where it currently is, but also how it seeks to, um, to expand. Um, but I think in, in, in terms of openness and in, in terms of what was happening in the space, I felt like I was in a room where conversations were happening that, that meant something to where the community was going. It, it felt like um, comments were being made, ideas were being floated that would have impact, that would live beyond this. And I think maybe, you know, this uh, innovation by Will, this idea to capture some thoughts from the, the symposium is you know, indicative of that. But the one thing that I take away is this idea of perhaps of resistance that in the room and in the conversations I had around the room with people, there seemed to be a, a, a resistance to defining the form, a resistance to the form becoming locked into something. Um, there was a, a, a willingness, an openness, a, um, an experimental impulse, um, sort of alive in the space and alive at the symposium to um, to really see what the video essay could do, to see what it could do for us as researchers, as innovators, but also as, I suppose, as as makers, as, as personal, um, as the tellers of stories was one of the things that I kind of was thinking about while I was talking to people. Um, so yeah, so that was my, uh, my reflection on Hanover. Thanks very much. Hi, my name is Oswald Eaton and I'm a video essayist and PhD researcher at the Lucerne University of Applied Arts and Sciences. For some time now, I've agreed with the definition of a video essay as an audiovisual media object that critically reappropriates existing audiovisual media objects, in the broadest sense. Yet it didn't prevent me from nominating works in the video essay poll that did not actually include the media object itself, but only some kind of reconstruction. I believe that this definition would be open enough to have common ground to talk about video essays and still prevent the form from becoming solidified in one specific best practice. But as I've been trying to sort my conflicting thoughts about the definition actually creating boundaries, it feels like every question leads to a couple of new ones beginning with this specific one. Does reappropriating audiovisual media objects also include reconstructing media experience? Or in other words, is it necessary to have the media object in question present when the topic is one's own media experience and not necessarily the media object itself? I mean, it's still both, of course, a video and an essay. Thus, the evolution of an art form is usually defined by pushing the envelope, like, I don't know, pushing boundaries. Do we really need to formulate these temporary definitions and boundaries just in order to think about pushing and breaking them? I mean, categories are a great tool to describe and think about something, of course, for recognizing constitutive elements, differences, ranges, possibilities. But in that sense, they don't have to be exhaustive or exclusive. What I see as a video essay may look uh, like a documentary or an experimental film to someone else and vice versa. And usually I learn something about my own work from listening to such outside perspectives. After all, as creators, we are rarely the best interpreters of our own works. Let's say we as a community have our own concept of what a video essay is at this moment in time. Describing the state of mind, like a general mode of criticism, but not the actual practical approach that should be kept as open as possible. Most of all, our definition should never limit what someone could or should do in a certain field. Which leads to the questions, who exactly defines what a video essay is? And if we assume that these are temporary definitions without uh, within our, our own community, then I ask myself, for whom are we creating these definitions? Do we want to delimit ourselves from the informal definitions of the broader community, like the so-called general public and 
to be honest, most YouTube creators? Could this also be about our self-conception as a group, like the manifesto of an artist's group like Die Brücke or something? And if it is more about community building, then does it have to be in the shape of a definition of the whole media form video essay? If we look at it as a dictionary entry, for example, do we really want to be like the Académie Française, who normatively decides what is allowed to be called a video essay? I mean, using videography as a method in my PhD, I can definitely see the need to find a profile sharp enough so that we are able to position us like as a community within an established scholarly environment with the goal of academic acceptance. But apart from those institutional questions, we should of course always remember that we as video essayists are part of a wider movement um, in the media landscape and therefore I think if someone defines their own work as a video essay, we should keep our minds open enough to consider it and if necessary broaden our informal understanding of what a video essay can be according to it. We benefit from our sense of community and connection the most if we develop into different directions, each bringing our unique perspective to the table. Ariane Hudley here, trying to reflect on the rich exchanges in Hanover. All right, how could I start? Chapter 1. They adored videographic criticism. They idolized this form all out of proportion. Uh, no, make that. They, they romanticized the form all out of proportion. To them, no matter what form the process took, whether desktop documentary, deformative, analytical voiceover or epigraph, this was still a form in the making, pulsating to the great tune of the sensuous and effective aspects of film. Mm-hmm. Now, let me start this over. Chapter 1. They were too romantic about videographic criticism in Hanover, probably because it contrasted with the rest of academic production, which tended to be far less glamorous. But they could always do better, strive to go beyond the heteronormative, western-centered look that had dominated their cultural background for so long. Nah, no, no, no too, too critical, maybe? Too dividing? <clears throat> I mean, you know... You don't want to rub anyone the wrong way. You want to go to other conferences like this. Okay, let me try and make it more concrete. Chapter 1. To them, audiovisual essays meant inventing explorative modes of deconstruction of audiovisual media objects. It was all about capturing aesthetic knowledge without the obligatory mediation of words. Although the form could no longer be considered as radically new in an age of perpetual media mutation and formal innovation, it remained a way of seeing formerly known media objects anew. Hmm, maybe too pretentious, I think? Chapter 1. They adored videographic criticism. To them, it was a rebellious attempt to reject the authority of so-called methods, of exploring a form of nebulous epistemics, of including in the research conclusions not just the findings, but also the hesitations and the uncertainties, the failures and the glitches. I love this. They were as inventive, as open as the videographic format they strive to elaborate. This was poetic scholarship. Behind their screens lied the coiled intellectual power of the new Deleuze and Guattari. Videography was their domain, open to all, here, there, and everywhere. And it always would be. My name is Emily Allegra Dreyfus. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Film University in Babelsberg, and I'm a newcomer to the videographic field. Openness in videography, as I understand it, is connected to a kind of dispositional quality of the videographer. I think it's a mode of attentiveness and radical openness to 
what we're looking at and listening to that allows us to deal creatively and exploratively with this material in a way that is keen to be itself rhetorical and engaging for an audience, but that is also happy with a kind of key truth, namely that whatever we create is going to be provisional, contingent, and unfinished, and that that is the end point that isn't an end point. Hi, this is Christina Brüning. I'm a PhD student at UT Austin in Media Studies, and I was one of the lucky mentees at the Hannover Symposium. So I got to work with Jason Mattel, who was so kind and super patient in uh, really walking me through the very first steps of videographic criticism. Um, because I'm actually so new to this, I had never even opened a video editing software before. So yeah, we had to start from the very beginning. Um, and I'm all the more grateful to him for being open, you know, to do this with me and uh, to everyone um, at the symposium to share thoughts and feedback and works in progress um, with all of us. Um, and, you know, in general, for me, I think this has just opened up a whole new way of doing academia, um, a new way of researching, of analyzing, of engaging critically with media that just wasn't part of my toolbox before. And now it can be. And now I can work with this and, you know, find out new exciting things. Um, so, yeah, um, one of the things that I wrote down in my notebook um, at the symposium was that videographic criticism brings back a sense of enchantment to academia. Um, and for me, you know, so far, that's actually very true to what my experience has been like. I'm very excited by this, um, very enchanted by the possibilities. Um, so I can't wait to delve deeper into it, to develop my skills and to see um, what I can do with this. Hello, this is Kevin Beely, and I just wanted to offer some reflections on my experience at the Hanover Videographic Film Studies Conference. It was the largest gathering of videographic film scho scholars that I'd ever taken part in. Um, and it was really just amazing to behold and to be in the presence of so many people who I've admired for their work and for their thinking over the years. Also to see multiple uh, micro generations of videographic film scholars, people who have gravitated to and adopted the practice over the last 15 or so years. You could especially see the influence of the Middlebury Videographic Workshop and you can just see like, um, you know, the 2017 class or the 2000 uh, 19 class represented in, in, um, in different um, contingencies, but also to see how they interacted and, and um, formed this larger community. It was really a privilege to be part of this community, to be included as a participant um, at the same time. And uh, there were those who made mention of this, that, you know, to be included is certainly a state of privilege and to be um, included by definition means that others are excluded. So it, it does beg the question of, you know, whose um, experiences, voices, whose minds are um, included and excluded and the extent to which this is a, a political formation um, that includes or excludes certain cultures, uh, languages. Uh, this was very much brought up in multiple presentations. I really appreciated the degree of sensitivity with regards to how the video essay is a form, not just for uh, revealing insights into media objects, but also revealing different modes of spectatorship, of different modes of audience experiences and configurations and really reflecting back on those who are doing the watching and whose watching is being made visible through the video essay. I think this is just such an important question to engage with. 
Um, so to think more about um, how our community is enabling or not enabling modes of participation in this discourse, as well as what works are acknowledged um, through this discourse. You know, there's there's really been become quite a genre of the videographic scholarly essay, even though that in itself is still being debated in terms of what defines a scholarly video essay. And as that's going on, uh, I, I think about how this connects to a larger context with multiple um, networks of what I would call or what could be called videographic practice, as you can find on YouTube videos and explainer videos, TikTok videos, social media, but also uh, film festivals, art galleries, uh, mainstream journalism. Uh, to what extent do these different forms of videographic practices uh, inform or are acknowledged and engaged by the scholarly practice, uh, just as the scholarly practice is really coming into its own and defining itself as distinct from those practices, how much interaction and intersection will there be? Uh, I think this, these kinds of tensions, uh, these categorical tensions are very productive, although probably not sustainable. <laughs> I think at some point, um, the videographic scholarly community, if it hasn't already, you know, will, as it's, as it's uh, defining itself, as it uh, increases its numbers, it itself might splinter into subgroups. Um, you know, you can point to things like the Dunbar effect, why, you know, there can only be so many relationships and bonds maintained at a certain time before things start to splinter. So, yeah, exciting times. Uh, certainly not static. Things will continue to evolve in the years to come. And it will be fascinating to, to follow all of these developments over time. My name is Maria Hoffman, and I'm a Video Camp 2018 alum. The best year, if anybody's asking. So I went to bed the other night still thinking about this question of openness as it emerged during the videography symposium a few weeks ago. And of course, I thought about the freedom of the form, visually, structurally, thematically, the comparably low importance of rank and experience, and the general welcoming, supportive and encouraging atmosphere that just feels so uniquely different from other academic communities, at least the ones I'm familiar with. Anyways, so I went to bed with these ruminations on my mind and had the strangest dream. I was at yet another video essay conference, again in Germany, and ended up doing this really hard crossword puzzle with Kevin B. Lee. Even though I remember the excessive use of whiteout, it seemed to be quite fun. And the thing is, I could absolutely see this thing happening in real life. So that's what openness in this community means to me. So Kevin, if you ever need a crossword puzzle partner, hit me up. <laughs>